This is ADTV. Brought to you by Amazing Discoveries. Good evening again. It's nice to be here with you tonight. And um, I'm a big fan of birds. I love all kinds of birds. And I love this picture of this duck here. And I was told this evening, as I was putting the slide on the screen, that it's Canadian. And that's, that's wonderful. I love, I love Canadian geese, Canadian ducks, mallards, whatever kind. And um, I put this slide on the screen because I'm just totally fascinated by the creativity of our God. You know, I'm so happy that he didn't make the sky gray or, or just one color. But God is into creativity. He's into diversity, and I'm so thankful for that. When one studies the Bible, there are many themes that are in the Bible. One of the greatest themes you'll find in the totality of the Holy Scriptures is the theme of restoration and redemption. God bringing sinful man back into heaven, back into uh, the Garden of Eden, um, when the earth made new. It is a wonderful theme in the Bible. Another theme you will see is the love of God, how God condescended and became like one of us to die for our sins. And one of the other themes that sometimes not often mentioned or spoken about is the theme of worship through the Bible. Worship is a very, very important component in the Bible. In fact, as we study the book of Revelation, you will find that Revelation, the book of Revelation, predicts a final conflict over true and false worship. This is very, very important. Now, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 14 for just a moment. And I would like to read to you two key passages in what Bible expositors call the three angels' messages of Revelation. Turn with me to Revelation 14. The references are there for you on the screen. Revelation 14, and we will look at verse 7 and verse, verse 9. Revelation 14, verse 7 and verse 9. Notice with me what the Bible says in verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that what? made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So Revelation 14 verse 7 tells us we should worship Him that did what? That made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. That's where we get our, our lecture topic tonight. Worship Him who made. So this message is going to go to the entire world because verse 6 tells us this. But then there is another call given in Revelation 14, and it is in verse 9. Notice with me Revelation 14 and verse 9. And it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. There are two beings or two, uh, or two people who are being worshipped or two things that are being worshipped in Revelation 14. Number one, the Creator God of heaven and earth and the beast. There's only two things that are being worshipped, friends. So this evening we want to determine how we can worship the Creator, because that's who I want to worship, and that's what we're going to look at tonight. Well, let's take a look, a brief um, bird's eye view, if you will, of the theme of worship in the Bible. If you have your Bibles and you have them readily accessible, if you turn to Genesis chapter 4, you will read a fascinating account of the first worship war in the Bible. Yes, this war took place right near the Garden of Eden, right after sin was introduced into the world. And there were two brothers. Does anyone know their names? These two brothers, of uh, the two sons of Adam and Eve. Does anyone know their names? Cain and Abel. Absolutely, Cain and Abel. And both Cain and Abel worship God. Were you aware of that? Both of them worship God. The only difference between Cain and Abel was this. 
One of them worshiped God in the way that God prescribed, and the other worshiped God contrary to what God said. Cain worshiped God according to his own mind. He actually worshiped God according to his works. He brought the fruit of the ground, the good things that he did, and he placed it on the altar. But Abel did exactly what God said do in order to worship him. He brought a lamb, and that lamb was sacrificed representative of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I'm sure if you looked at both of these, both of these sacrifices, one of them that looked prettier was the fruit, right? That looks much more prettier than a, a dead carcass, but God prescribed that the lamb would be the symbol that would represent Jesus Christ. So this is very, very important. I want you to really remember this because one of them worshiped God in the right way and the other worshiped God in the wrong way. And what happened to Abel? Does anyone remember after this? He was killed, right? Abel rose up and persecuted him and killed his brother. Okay, let's take a look at another um, a scenario of worship in the Bible. This one is in the book of Daniel. We've been studying the book of Daniel. And this one took place in chapter 3 of Daniel. And here in Daniel 3, we have a story of, 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 of they made an image, a golden image, which represented Nebuchadnezzar's mighty kingdom of Babylon. And everyone bowed down to worship this image except three faithful Hebrews who said, you know what? We don't care what the crowd does. We're going to worship God how he says worship us. We're going to make a stand. We're going to worship Christ. We don't even care what happens to us. He says, King, if we're burnt up, let it be so. But we're not going to bow down and worship your image no matter what you do. And what did they do? They stood sternly for God and they were thrown into this furnace of fire. And praise God that Jesus Christ met them in the furnace. And friends, he'll do the same thing for you today. If you make a stand for Christ, it won't be easy. It won't be the popular thing. But if you make a stand for Christ, he will meet you in the fire. He will meet you to, to help you through this uh, ordeal. The next scenario of worship we're going to look at was what our Lord himself went through. Uh, remember the story very well when Jesus Christ was baptized. What happened after Jesus Christ was baptized? Does anyone remember? He was tempted 40 days in the wilderness by the devil. And this is interesting. Right after his baptism, he was tempted. Do you think that Christians today after their baptism are tempted too? Absolutely. The devil's uh, uh, strategy doesn't change. He just fine-tunes it so we are unaware of his strategy. But after he, was, um, after he was baptized, he was there in the wilderness, and the devil came to him, and he didn't appear to him um, like a bat-winged freak that many times the devil is portrayed as. But the Bible tells us, if you have your Bible, you can turn to 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 14, and it will tell you that the devil transforms himself into what? Do you know? An angel of light. Absolutely. So the devil appeared to him in probably dazzling glory, because if he looked like the devil, then Jesus would have known it right quick. But Jesus did not know immediately until the devil opened his mouth. And the devil said, if you are the Son of God, what should you do? Make those stones into bread, right? He was using this language, and immediately when Jesus heard this, he knew that he had an imposter on his hands. It wasn't a true angel. And as he was uh, talking, or he wasn't talking, as the devil came to him, Jesus said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And friends, that is good uh, food for thought for us today, is it not? We should not just be concerned about the physical food, but we should be more interested in the spiritual food, friends. So anyway, what happened is after this, the devil came to him again and, and he said, the last temptation, he said, I will give you the glories of the world if you will fall down and worship me. So this battle of worship has been fought throughout the entire Bible. In fact, friends, this is very interesting, but the word worship occurs 24 times in the book of Revelation. That is more than any other book in the entire Bible. That is more than the book of Proverbs. That is more than the book of Psalms. It is more than the book of, the, of Jeremiah or Isaiah. The word worship is repeated more in that book, the book of Revelation, than any other book. In fact, the book of Revelation is the platform or is the word worship is the battlefield or the battleground of the book of Revelation. You know, many people are, are concerned about armies and so forth, and they are important for us to, to realize what's happening in the world. But the spiritual warfare is the pivotal warfare in the book of Revelation. And as we look in the book of Revelation, 
We're going to be looking at verse chapter 13 this evening. And as you read chapter 13 of Revelation, you will find some incredible descriptive language describing this beast in Revelation chapter 13. This is not a beast that you would like to see in the streets of Maple Ridge, is it? You would not like to walk around the corner and see this beast in the alley somewhere. No, 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 no. You wouldn't see this beast, friends, because this is a symbolic beast representing kingdom, a kingdom. And you'll notice very quickly, I'll just run it through really briefly with you, that this beast in Revelation 13 is comprised of all the different uh, uh, elements, if you will, body parts of the beast that we, beast we find in Daniel chapter 7. So this beast is a composite or an amalgamated beast. And you'll notice there are seven heads. If you count the heads in Daniel 7, you'll come to that very same number, seven. You'll see that it has the feet of a bear, the body of a leopard. So this beast is a composite beast of all the kingdoms in Daniel 7 in one beast. And we're going to look a little bit about that tonight. Let's look at verse 3. And it says, And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded. And we came to the unfortunate conclusion to find that it was papal Rome, the Roman Catholic system, not the Roman Catholic people. So this system was identified. And it's very fascinating, friends, that this head that was wounded was when in 1798 Napoleon sent his general there into Vatican City and they took the Pope captive, and it dissolved the political and religi uh, the religio-political power of the Roman papal power. And at that time, it was no longer recognized as such. But something happened, friends, in 1929, and I'll continue reading this to describe it to you. The next part of the verse says, And his deadly wound was what? Healed. So something happened to the papal power that it healed from the religio-political wound that it received. Well, it's fascinating. If you, if you look in history, I'll put this slide on the screen in a little bit later, in a little bit of later lecture. But in 1929, friends, there was a document that was signed that gave the papal power back, the religio and political power back to the papal see. And at that time, it, can, it became a republic once again. So it seemed as if it was wounded mortally, but yet it was healed. Very interesting. There was someone else that was mortally wounded and came back from that mortal wound. Do you know what his name was? Jesus Christ. Remember that? Jesus received a mortal wound, friends, but he was healed. He came from the grave. And this Antichrist power is doing the same thing to personate Jesus Christ. So this was happened in 1929. We have a whole lecture coming up more about this. But notice what else it says, friends. After that, this wound was healed, what happened? It says, and how much of the world came after the beast? Some of the world, all of the world marveled and followed the beast. So friends, let me just say it like this before we get started tonight. If we should discover this evening that there is something that the whole world is doing that seems it's in the Bible, but it's not really supported by the Bible, it should not be a surprise to us. Because the Bible says that all the world would marvel and follow the beast. And friends, this evening I'm going to tell you some things that are very, very startling it's Revelation 13. Let's look at verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. And I want you to notice verse 4. And they worship the dragon, which gave power to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Over and over and over in Revelation 13, you will find the word worship mentioned. In fact, it's mentioned five times in that short chapter alone. Let's look at verse 8. What does verse 8 have to say? It says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Again, this concept of worship worshiping the beast. Verse 12, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. This is speaking of the second beast. We're going to talk about that Friday night. And he causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And what about verse 15? And he had power to give life to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Killed. So friends, worship is a very important theme in Revelation 13. But friends, I am so excited, I am so happy that God gives us another message. 
God gives us a counter message to the message against worshiping the beast. God has a message for us to worship the Creator, the one that made the heavens and the earth. Let's take a look at that just now. Revelation 14, excuse me, this is the, set, this is the other message, but we'll look at the next message in just a moment. This is um, the message against worshiping the beast. Then, I, then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Friends, what you have just heard and what you have just seen is the most solemn, startling warning ever given to the inhabitants of the earth. It is the most serious warning that has ever been given. It is more serious than the message that was given to Noah during the flood times. It is more serious because you, whoever partakes of this will drink the undiluted wrath of God. Isn't that serious? It is very serious. Now, what kind of God do we serve? Do we serve a God who hates or do we serve a, lo serve a loving God? A loving God, right? We serve a God who loves. And sometimes God hates the things that, we, that should be hated. But for the most part, God is completely love. In fact, if you have your Bible, 1 John 4, 8 says, For God is what? Love. For God is love. 1 John 4, 8. So would it make sense if God gave such a striking message, such a hard message, and He said, you're going to drink the wine of the wrath of God, and, but then He would say, well... I'm not going to tell you what, what this is all about. That wouldn't make much sense, would it? So God has to describe to us what this is. And we'll be talking about that tomorrow, if you come back. Uh, notice verse 6. It says, Then I saw another angel. The word angel there means messenger. It, it means a message will go forth to the entire world, a message flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tribe and tongue and people. This message of the gospel is going to go to the entire world. But this gospel that is preached is in the context of verses 7, 8, and 9. Well, what does verse 7 say? It says, fear God and give glory to Him. What does it mean to fear God? Some people are afraid of God. They're afraid if they, if they walk a certain way, God is going to zap them from heaven. When the Bible says fear God, friends, it's not talking about being scared. It's talking about respecting and having a reverence for a holy God. In Psalm 33, verse 8, it talks about to stand in awe of God. And in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, it says, this is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So the fear God component deals with respecting God and respecting Him so much that you obey Him, that you love Him so much. So what else is going to take place here in this final message to the world? For the hour of His judgment is come, and what does the rest of the, ver rest of the verse say? And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. You see, friends, the beast has a message, and his message is, worship me. Worship the beast. But God's message is, no, 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 don't worship the beast. Worship me, the one who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of waters. Friend, there's only two messages in the end of times. Either worship the beast or worship the one who made. There's only two. Now, I want to take you to the words of Jesus Christ just now. And um, I want you to pay close attention to this verse. Matthew 28 and verse 18. Notice what Jesus has to say. This is part of the Great Commission. We've looked at verse 19 and 20 already. But notice verse 18. It says, And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power... What's another word for all power? All authority, all power... All power is given unto who? To me, to Jesus, in heaven and in earth. So according to the very words of Jesus Christ, the power was invested in who? In Christ, right? The power was given to Jesus and Jesus alone. And he said, the power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Well, friends, I hate to tell you this evening, but there is another power that says, no, power hasn't been given to Jesus alone. It's been given to us. And we've already looked at some of these things, but tonight I want to take you through one of these characteristics that we did not get a chance to cover on Saturday night. And that is that the little horn, the Antichrist power, would think 
to change times and laws. Friends, let me ask you a question this evening. Can any person on this earth change God's law? Can they? Absolutely not. There is no person on this planet that could actually change God's law. In order for you to change God's law, what you would have to do is get up into heaven and knock God off His throne somehow because His throne, the, the Bible in Psalm says the, the habitation of His throne is the very law of God. You'd have to go to heaven, knock God off His throne, change it up there to really change the law of God. But friends, that's not going to happen, is it? God's, word, God's law was written in stone signifying its perpetual nature and its unchanging nature. So friends, this evening we're just going to look at a few things. Let me remind you of this verse we looked at on Saturday evening. Speaking of this little horn power, the church of the Middle Ages, it says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High. Remember we looked at that, how this power would speak blasphemy, claiming to forgive sin on earth, claiming to be God on earth. And it shall wear out the saints of the Most High. We saw that this power was a persecuting power, killing millions of, of people. And notice the next part of this verse. And think to change times and laws. Friends, this is what the Bible said would happen. The question is, friends, did it take place? Was there a change in the holy constitution of God, the Ten Commandments? Or has it yet to happen? Well, let's find out. What you're about to see, friends, is ten shocking claims from this power that we've already identified, sadly, on Saturday night. But these are ten shocking claims about this very issue, about them changing the very commandments of God. And grab hold of your seat if you want to, because we're going to see some very startling things. This first statement we've already read to you, but we'll read it once more tonight. It says, The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. That is his own, that's from their own, own statement there. So according to the uh, official teachings of the papal power, that the Pope has the power to change what Christ says. Okay, let's take another look at another statement. This one is from the book Prompta Biblioteca, an article called Papa or Pope, and it says the Pope can modify divine law. He can change what God has said, according to this power. This is a catechism. I have it in my possession. I don't have it with me tonight, but you can go on the internet and order it if you like. If you don't believe me, you can order the book. Um, it's a catechism called the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine by Reverend Peter Geierman, CSSR. And this is a very interesting statement that he makes. Uh, the, question, uh, the catechism is written, of course, in a question-answer format. And the question is, which is the Sabbath day? Okay, this is a catechism from the Roman Catholic Church. And the answer is, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Very fascinating. What else does he have to say? Why do we observe Sunday instead of Sabbath? Answer, because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Question, who changed it? Did Jesus change it? No, the church changed it. So who has more power, Jesus or the church? According to them, the church has more power. Friends, this is the issue at the end of time. God, is he the one that has the authority or does man have the authority? Let's take a look at this next statement. I don't want to give you just one. I want to give you ten of them so you'll see that I'm not making this up. This is from the Catholic Encyclopedia, uh, volume 4, page 153. It says the following, the church, after changing the day of rest from the uh, Jewish Sabbath of the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment referred to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. So the church, according to them, changed it. They made the third commandment refer to Sunday. Now those of you who know the Ten Commandments, which commandment refers to the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments? The third commandment? The fourth commandment. So what happened to the third one? Well, basically what took place is the third commandment was very, how do you say, inconvenient for the church at that time because the idolatry was so rampant, they didn't like that commandment, so that was taken out and it was the, everything else went up and the last commandment of coveting was divided into two. We'll talk about that tomorrow evening in more detail. 
So that's what took place. So the third commandment became referring to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. But notice the church changed it, not Jesus. Very interesting. Here's another statement from Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 38 by Carl Keating. And he says, Fundamentalists meet for worship on Sunday. Fundamentalists, those who believe in the Bible and the Bible alone. But he goes on by saying, Yet there is no evidence in the Bible that corporate worship was to be made on Sundays. The Jewish Sabbath or day of rest was, of course, Saturday. It was the Catholic Church who decided Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. So, friends, this is a very, very serious issue. They have claimed, this papal system has claimed, that they have changed the day and that fundamentalists meet on Sunday because they're following what we say, not what the Bible says. Notice the next statement from James Gibbons, a cardinal. This is in Faith of Our Fathers, page 561. He says, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and yet you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. He's very, very blatant about it, very unabashed, that if you read the whole Bible, you will not find that there's any indication whatsoever of the change from Saturday to Sunday. Again, what else does he say? The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. And this is Roman Catholic um, documents here. Here's another statement from our Sunday visitor. Christendom is indebted to the Catholic Church for the institution of Sunday as the Sabbath day. In keeping Sunday, non-Catholics are simply following the practice of the Catholic Church for 1,800 years, a tradition and not a Bible ordinance. Fascinating. Could this be possible, friends? Could this be really what is happening? Or is this just a, a, a smokescreen or a lie? Let's take a look at another statement. This is from the Bible Encyclopedia, page 561. Sabbath, a Hebrew word signifying rest, and Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshiped the sun. Now, if you read your Bible right now, you will not find it saying Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? You will not find it because those days, the names of those days were added later. But you will find first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, uh, preparation day or sixth day, and Sabbath or seventh day. You will find that, but you won't find the Thursday, Friday, and all that. So this is interesting. He says that the name Sunday came about was because of the worship of the sun that heathens practiced in those times, and even in our time, actually. Here's another statement. It says, The sun was a foremost god with heathendom. There is, in truth, something royal, kingly about the sun, making it a fit emblem of Jesus, the son of justice. So he says, you know, the sun is very royal. And he goes on by saying, Hence the church in these countries would seem to have said, Keep that old pagan name. It shall remain consecrated and sanctified. So again, there's no denying it, friends. They themselves have said, and this was not an old, too old of an article. This was 1994. This wasn't in the Dark Ages. This was pretty new. Um, here's another statement. And thus the pagan Sunday dedicated to Balder, or Baal, as you read in the Old Testament, became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. But again, as they said, there was no Bible no Bible evidence whatsoever. Here is a, a little picture here of some of the practices that happen as they worship the sun toward the east. Very interesting. And um, this was very common. And the reason why this was done, people asked the question, they said, well, why? Why did they change it? Well, you see, friends, there was a problem. They wanted to bring in people into the church, but they wanted to keep it in such a way, politically correct, so that people wouldn't get offended. So they said, you know what? Come in and you can bring your idols. You can bring those things into the church. It's okay. And we'll worship on your day now. So they made a compromise. And compromise isn't a good thing to do in the Christian life. That's for sure. Here's another statement. This is from the Baptist manual. This isn't from the, the Roman Catholic system. This is from the Baptist church. And it says, What a pity that Sunday comes branded with the mark of paganism and christened with the name of the Son God. Then adopted and sanctioned by the papal apostasy, and bequeathed as a sacred legacy to Protestantism. So this is a, a Baptist uh, theologian, a doctor speaking these things. So 
the question we want to ask ourselves now is this. This is a very important question. Are these claims true? Is this true, what the papal power has said? Or is it, again, another smokescreen? Well, friends, the best way to find out is to look in the Bible and ask ourselves the question, when was the Sabbath day instituted? When did the Sabbath come about? Was it merely in the Old Testament or New Testament? Well, let's find out going back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. This is the first time the Sabbath is mentioned, and I'll read it in your hearing. Verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. You see, after God created the world in six days, He said, let me do something extra on this next day. Verse 2 says, And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had made. Very interesting language. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. This is the first time the Sabbath is mentioned in the whole Bible. And let me just remind you, at this time, let me go back here for just a second, um, at this time, Adam and Eve were the only people on earth, correct? There was not a Jewish nation at this time. There was no Jew. Adam and Eve were not Jew, but yet the Sabbath was made for them. Very, very interesting. Let's take a look at what the seventh day was all about. Let's take a look. First of all, the Bible says that God blessed that day. And when God blesses something, let's take a look in um, the book of Numbers for just a moment. Numbers chapter 23. I wasn't um, planning on going here, but God says go here. Numbers 23. And let's take a look at verse, verse 19. Numbers 23. Verse 19, Numbers, you'll find that, like I think the fourth book of the Old Testament. Verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? And notice verse 20. Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. You see, when God blesses something, friends, he cannot make a reversal of that blessing. And God said very clearly that what he blessed he cannot reverse. So God blessed this day, the seventh day. What else did He do? He sanctified that day. He set that day apart. And the word sanctify is just, um, all it means is to set apart for a holy use. Um, for example, what kind of Bible do you have? What does it say on the front of your Bible? Holy Bible, right? It is set apart for a holy use. It is a holy book. It is set apart for God. And um, it's very, very fascinating. Um, for example, those of you who have pets, who here has dogs? I see your hands. Anyone who has a dog? Okay, a few of you have dogs. Your dog probably, I would guess, has a bowl that is sanctified for that dog, right? That bowl is set apart for the dog to eat out of, right? You would not take the dog's bowl and after the dog eats his alpo or kibbles and bits or whatever dogs eat these days, you would not take that bowl that he just ate out of and put it on your kitchen table and put in corn pops, right? Or, and put in, in milk and, and eat it. Let's hope not, right? If you did that, you would have some issues. But when you, you set apart that bowl for that dog, God also sets apart things for his people as holy. For example, in the sanctuary, there was holy instruments that God set apart. So God set this day apart as separate and special. Number three, what else did God do to this day? The Bible says that he rested on it. He rested. Now, does God ever get tired, do you think? Does God ever get sweaty and say, man, this is too much work making all these worlds and everything? No, friends. God doesn't get tired like we get tired. But God rested almost to suggest to us today that he did everything he could possibly do. It was perfect, and then he rested. Friends, when you think about this in light of redemption... Is there anything you and I can do to add to what Jesus has done for us? Not a thing. You can't do anything to add to what Jesus... Jesus lived a perfect life, and the creation was created perfectly, and He rested. And the very first day that Adam and Eve had, they were created on the sixth day. Can you imagine they were created, and the next day He said, Rest. Rest in My presence. Spend time with Me. Get to know Me as a friend. So God rested on that day. And as you survey the Old Testament, you read of, of, of Moses... And Moses had 40 years walking in the wilderness with a lot of very 
um, how do you say, um, people who really enjoyed to do what Moses said, right? They really were just so quick to follow what Moses said. No, right? They were stubborn, hard-hearted people, just like us, right? They didn't want to do what God said. So they had to march in the wilderness for many years. And here's a picture of uh, perhaps what it may have looked like there where Moses um, actually struck the rock, which he shouldn't have. He was supposed to just speak to it, and, but water came out uh, anyway. But then in Exodus 16, you'll come across a very interesting uh, event that happened. Right after they were delivered from the Egyptian bondage, God did something special for the children of Israel. Notice with me in Exodus 16 and verse 26. It says, Six days you will gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. Um, this was this food that He was giving them, this manna, this very healthy food. And He says, but they kept resisting to do it. And notice what God said. He said, how long do you refuse to keep what? My commandments and my laws. And friends, this took place before they got to Mount Sinai, before God spoke the Ten Commandments and gave it to them written in stone. So this was pre-Sinai. This was before um, they went to the mount there. So God even then instructed them in the Sabbath. Because when they were in Egypt, friends, they forgot about God. And actually, if you read Exodus chapter 3 through 5, I didn't have time to cover it tonight, but Exodus 3 through 5, Pharaoh made the children of Israel do what? Do you remember what he made them do? He made them work, right? He made them work on their holy day. So they forgot about the Sabbath. And notice with me in Isaiah what it has to say. Every Jew who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, I will bring to my holy mountain. Every Jew. Is that what it says? No, it says everyone who keeps from defiling my, the Sabbath, I will bring to my holy mountain. So the Sabbath was very important to God. It was written with His own finger in tables of stone. And does anyone know the very first word of that commandment? Anybody who's read the Ten Commandments before? Remember. Remember. Why do you think God said remember? Perhaps He knew that we would be so easy to forget this very, very important commandment. And um, let's take a look at the rest of the verse. Look what it says. And He would make them joyful in, his, in My house of prayer, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So the Sabbath, friends, was not intended merely for the Jew, but for the entire scope of humanity. Let's read that fourth commandment if we can. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So how we are to remember it is not just by intellectually walking down the street and saying, yeah, I know today is the Sabbath, but we're to remember it by keeping it holy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a moment, how to do that. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you will do no work. You, for in six days the Lord made... Notice the language here. Absolutely stunning. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Friends, this is spoken again in Revelation 14, 7. This is a message that God wants everyone to be aware of, that worship Him who made. Keep the Sabbath holy. Now I want to ask you a question. Let me just go back for just a moment to this, one of the previous slides here. What does verse 9 say? It says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Sometimes people say, well, you know what, John, I, I appreciate what you're sharing. I think it's true and everything. But you know what? I keep every day holy. I keep every day holy, you know, I, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's all a Sabbath to me. I keep every day holy. But you see, friends, there's a problem. Because the Bible says six days you are to do your work. And the seventh day you are to rest, right? So if someone's keeping every day holy, what are they not doing? They're not working, right? <laughs> they're, they're lazy. They're not working. So six days, the Bible says, you will labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest. It is a wonderful day. And it's not a burden. It's a day of life. And um, let me continue reading the last part. It says, And he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy or hallowed it. So this is very, very important. Now, you might be wondering, well, what's so important about the Sabbath anyway? I mean, it, it's, just, it's just resting. What's the big deal? Remember the first word of that commandment? What was it one more time? Remember. 
Do you think that the world by large has really remembered the Sabbath? As you look out there in the streets and you see young people shooting drugs in their veins or smoking this and that, do you think they've actually remembered the Sabbath? Do you think they've remembered their Creator? Friends, I don't believe they have. Because I'll show you real quick, just in a small nutshell, the high cost of forgetting this important commandment. Number one, when we forget the Sabbath, we have a lack of meaning in life. We forget that there was a Creator who made us. We forget that there is a being that is greater than us. And sometimes we think we control our own destinies. Have you ever felt that way? Oh, I can do it. I can handle it. Man, you can't handle anything. You've got to take it to the Lord to handle anything. In, order, in other words, the Sabbath will help us in fostering our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's like a weekly, I hate to use the word, but a weekly relationship or some people even say uh, date with God. And I, hate to, I don't use that word in a blasphemous way by any means, but we need time to, with God to foster our relationship. Number two, it, the reason we have forgotten, the reason we have such an identity crisis is we forgot. Did you know, friends, if we kept the Sabbath from the beginning, like God has instructed, that evolution, evolutionary thought would not be with us. We believe that we came from monkeys. In fact, um, just a few weeks ago, you may have seen Time magazine, and it talked about how we became human from the, 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 from the monkey. Now, friends, if I am a public school student and I'm sitting there in the classroom learning about science and so forth, and the teacher tells me that I came from a, a primate, what do you think that does for my self-esteem and, and, and my uh, um, way I view myself? Do I look at myself as a wonderful being made in the very image of God? Or do I look at myself as just an animal like all the others? I look at myself as an animal. And did you know, friends, in the United States and even North America, I should say, in North America, would someone tell me what the number one cause of death is among teenagers? Does anyone know? Suicide. Suicide. So we have forgotten who, where we came from. We've forgotten God. We've forgotten the Sabbath. And because we forget that God created us, people are killing themselves. They think there's no hope. But there is hope. Number four, evolutionists has come into being because of this, this um, high cost of forgetting. Also, skepticism about God. Skepticism about the Bible. Agnosticism, which is very similar, which says we cannot know that God exists. We cannot know He's there. We cannot know. But friends, if you study prophecy, can you know that God is real? I believe you can, absolutely, because God is so amazingly clear. Notice verse 12 of Ezekiel 20 as we talk more about this issue. Notice what it says. Moreover, I also gave them whose Sabbaths? My Sabbath. It's not our Sabbath or the Jews' Sabbath, it's God's Sabbath, friends. This is God's Sabbath. And he says, to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. You see, friends, the Sabbath is a symbol, it is a sign of how God makes His people holy. I am so happy that I can't make myself holy. Have you ever met anyone that says that thinks they're holy before? When people tell you how holy they are, you know right quick they're not very holy, right? If they say, oh, I'm, I'm very holy, you know, I don't do this or that, I'm a holy person. And say, so, okay, well, obviously you're not very holy. It's kind of like someone who tells you how humble they are. I have a friend of mine who tells a very funny story, and he says that, you know, one time there was a man in a village who was very humble, one of the most humble men he'd ever seen. And this man was in the village, and as he was there, um, the, the, the villagers awarded him a, an award of being the most humble man. And he was so happy because he received this award. And it was this big medallion, and he wore it on his chest, and it said, Most Humble Man. And the next day, he went out into the village, and he was walking around town with his badge of humbleness, humility, you know. And as soon as the townspeople saw it, they said, Give me that thing. You're not humble. You're wearing your award. Right? So God... He sanctifies us. He is the one that's making us holy. We can't make ourselves holy. And the Sabbath is a reminder that God is the one that makes us holy. You know, we can't make ourselves holy whatsoever. What about Jesus Christ? Now, this is important because Christ, let's see what day he kept holy, okay? Lotus with me, Luke 4, 16. It says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So when you would look, when you wanted to go find Jesus Christ, 
You would not go to the carpenter shop to try to find him. He wasn't there working on his, his projects. When you wanted to find Jesus, you would go to the synagogue and you would find him there on the Sabbath day. So he went up there to read. Well, someone might say, well, so that's easy. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. Yes, he was. He was a Jew. But you'll see very soon that even Gentiles kept the Sabbath after the resurrection. Look at Mark 2.27. The Sabbath was made for man or humanity and not man for the Sabbath. Friends, sometimes people look at the Sabbath as a torture. But friends, God made the Sabbath to be a day of delight, a day of blessing, a day of rest, a day of realizing that we have a Creator God who loves us and wants to take care of us. So the Sabbath was a day for that and still is today. And many people, they will say, they will say, well, when Jesus was on this earth, He broke the Sabbath. He always did, you know, was doing good things on the Sabbath. The Jews accused Him of breaking the Sabbath. But you know what Jesus was, friends? Jesus was a Sabbath reformer. He came to teach the people how to keep it holy. Notice what he did. It says, he said, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You see what happened back in this time? The Jewish leaders put so many rules and regulations on the Sabbath that weren't even there. They actually said that you couldn't walk a certain uh, um, of, of feet or miles away without doing something. You had to have pails of water here and there so you could make a Sabbath day journey. They put so many rules and regulations on the Sabbath that were not in the Bible. And the people looked at the Sabbath as a day of dread. They said, oh, here it comes again. It's the Sabbath. But you see, friends, Jesus came to show us we don't have to be, that wasn't the way it was really to be. He came to show that it's good to do well on the Sabbath, to help others. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And this is always a very interesting one. You know what? I have spoken to some ministers of varying Christian backgrounds, and, and I love talking with people from other faiths. It always gives me new insights to the Bible. And I've met some Christian brothers and sisters who said, You know, the Sabbath was, isn't for us today. That, that Sabbath was nailed to the cross. And I said, Okay, well, all right. Well, what you're saying basically is the whole law is nailed to the cross, right? They say, oh yes, the law, we don't need the law anymore. We don't need to worry about it. I say, well, okay, and if that's the case, then, you know, I can steal from stores. I can go into, I can go into Best Buy, you know, one of the, you guys have Best Buy here in Canada? It's an uh, electronic store, you know? I can go into Best Buy and see something. Oh, wow, there's, there is a uh, nice uh, a component for my computer. I can just steal it since the law of God is nailed to the cross and I won't get in trouble, right? No, friends. The law of God, if you take away one, you take away all of them, right? So Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We don't have to blow our car horn or do any silly things like that. We just have to obey Jesus out of love. Now, what did Jesus himself say about the Sabbath? This is very compelling evidence. When I was wrestling with these things a few years ago, this passage here was like a haunting verse in my mind that God kept using to, to, to bring to my mind this Sabbath truth. I want to show you Matthew 24, verse 20. Notice what Jesus says here. He's speaking to the disciples. He's speaking to those that are around Him in Matthew 24. This took place in around 31 A.D., um, right near Jesus' death. And He says, And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. And someone may say, well, what's so important about that? That was in his day, right? Well, friends, what you're, what you're forgetting is that this chapter was prophetic. Jesus was speaking to the, to the people there about the, the destruction of Jerusalem. He said that a temple will be destroyed, and it, and it was destroyed in 70 A.D. It was destroyed by the Roman armies. And he was telling the people, Please pray that your flight not be in the winter or on the Sabbath day. So let me ask you a question. If Jesus warned the people or warned them to pray that you don't flee on the Sabbath, that which would happen in 70 A.D. after the cross, after the resurrection, do you think that if He warned them not to pray that your flight be on the Sabbath, that the Sabbath would still be important after the cross? I believe it would be because Jesus warned them this would happen after the cross. And many people say, well, say, well, the Sabbath was before the cross. No, 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 no. The Sabbath, as you will find, is much longer than just after or just before the cross. What about Jesus himself? When Jesus died on the cross, what happened 
after that. Let's take a look. Luke 23. And notice with me verse 54. It says, That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the Sabbath was getting closer. So that was the day before the Sabbath when Jesus died on the cross. And notice with me what verse 30, 55 says, And the woman who had, came, who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Verse 56, Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. What commandment was it? It was the fourth commandment, right? So evidently, friends, that the Sabbath was so important to the followers of Christ that they rested even from embalming the body of their Lord. Now, if, if I was living back then, I would think of things I could do on the Sabbath. I would think, well, you know, I'm doing God's work. This is um, helping, you know, I'm embalming the body of Jesus. This would be holy work. But it, the Sabbath was so important to Jesus, friends, that his disciples would not even take care of his body on that day. They let him rest in the grave on the Sabbath all Sabbath long. Now notice verse 1 of the next chapter. It says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. So friends, this Sabbath was so important that the close followers of Jesus said, You know what? We're going to wait till the Sabbath is over to do the job. And they came early morning the first day of the week. Fascinating little nuggets of history in the Bible. So let me give you a quick rundown of these order of events we've just looked at. On Friday, the preparation day, Jesus died on the cross. On Saturday, the Sabbath, he rested in the tomb. The ladies did not um, anoint him for his burial. And on early Sunday morning, the first day of the week, praise God, Jesus burst through the tomb and he was risen again. So today, as we, we, we think, some say, they say, well, how, how do you know which day is the Sabbath? You can't know. It's been lost. Friends, it's very clear because this, everyone realizes that Jesus rose the first day of the week, and Christians celebrate that as Easter Sunday. So everyone is aware of that. So the day before was the Sabbath. It's very clear right in the Bible. And in fact, this to me is even more evidence did you realize that in 108 languages throughout the entire world that the word for the seventh day is Sabbath? Uh, Saturday is Sabbath. For example, um, my friends back home who speak uh, Spanish, the name for Saturday in Spanish is Sabado, right? And it means Sabbath. Throughout the, la throughout the la languages throughout the world, the word for Sabbath is Saturday. And so this word, this day has not been lost. This day is still there. And it's a day that God has kept for us to keep holy, to draw closer to Him. What about after the resurrection? Let's take a look in Acts 17 and verse 1. Notice with me what the Bible says. They came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Verse 2, then Paul as his custom was. So not only Jesus' custom, but also Paul's custom. They went into... They, as, excuse me, let me start from the beginning. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. So here, this was Paul's custom. And people say, again, Paul was a Jew. He, of course he kept the Sabbath. But friends, let me take you to this verse. Then your socks will be blown off by this. This is amazing. Verse 42 of Acts 13, notice what it says. The Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them tomorrow on the new Sabbath. Is that what it says? It says that they begged that the words be preached to them the next Sabbath. So friends, if there was a change in the day by Jesus or the disciples, this would be a perfect place for that change to be evident. To say, no, this is, the new Sabbath is tomorrow. Preach to us tomorrow. Preach to us the next day. But it says the next Sabbath. And notice verse 44. And on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. So friends, the Sabbath was not just for the Jew. The Sabbath was for the believers. Everyone was worshiping on that day. Acts 16 and verse 13 says, And on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. 
God on the Sabbath wants us to, to, to come out in nature and enjoy the beautiful creations that He has made, to, to see the abundance of creation that God has made to remind us of His creative power, how He can change our very lives. The last part of the verse says, And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. What about Acts? What about Revelation 1.10? Some people say, well, you know, I don't keep the Sabbath. I don't, I don't keep the first day. I keep the Lord's Day. And that's, 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 the new, that's the new Sabbath. That's the first day of the week. Revelation 1.10. In fact, this is the only place in the Bible you will find this phrase used. Lord's Day. It's not any other place in the Bible, this phrase, Lord's Day. But the Bible tells us which day this is. Let's look at what Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So the Sabbath day is the Lord's day. In fact, Mark, basically the same phrase that Jesus used repeated in three of the Gospels there. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Same thing. So God's Sabbath, He's the Lord of the Sabbath day of the New Testament. In fact, notice what it says on the screen. The Sabbath of the Creator God in Genesis is the Lord's day of revelation. God doesn't change, friends. Why would He change a perfect law? Why would He change it? It makes no sense whatsoever. Revelation 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Friends, the commandments of God are very, very important in these last days. The commandments of God are at the forefront of the battle between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. And those who follow what God says in His Word will be on His side. And those who make small compromises will be on the other side. Let's take a brief look at the summary of the Sabbath that we looked at thus far. Number one, the Sabbath was given at creation. We've seen that this evening. From Genesis 2, 1 through 3, the Bible says clearly, for the Lord made the Sabbath as a memorial of creation. Number two, the Sabbath was given at Sinai. It was given by God Himself on fingers, on a... His finger on stone written there for us to see even now. Number three, it was kept by His people all the way through. It was kept by the Israel, Israel of old. Number four, it was kept by our Savior, Jesus Christ Himself. Number five, it was honored by the disciples even after the cross, the Sabbath was observed. The Sabbath was observed. Number six, it is a sign of God's power in making His people holy. We cannot make ourselves holy. You know, if you, if you move away into the country, that's a great thing to do, by the way. It's nice to be in the country. But if you move away in the country and you sit there and you say, oh, I'm sitting out here so I can become holy. Friends, that won't make you holy. Only God can make you holy. He's the only one that can do that. Number seven, it is kept on the new earth. When God makes the new earth, the Sabbath will be kept in the new earth. And I'll show you that just now. From the, very, from the Word of God. Isaiah 66, verse 22 and 23. It says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, saith the Lord. What does it say there? Does it say all the Jews? What does it say? All flesh, everyone that is in heaven, will worship God on the Sabbath. There are going to be millions of people, I believe, that will be keeping their first Sabbath in heaven because they never heard of this truth before. They never had the opportunity to learn that the Sabbath was the day that God set aside in the beginning. They'll be keeping their first Sabbath there with Jesus. And remember the commandment. Let me repeat this one more time as we close this evening. Exodus 20, verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Now I want you to, very, to really pay attention to this last part. For in six days, notice this, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And He rested on the seventh day. Therefore He blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Or made it holy. So friends, the Sabbath was a day that he, he, put, he set aside because He made the heavens and the earth. Now what do we find in Revelation 14? Unbelievable stuff. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who, what? 
made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. Friends, this is a direct quote from the fourth commandment, this last message to be given. God is giving forth a message in these last days to tell everyone, come away from believing that you came from apes and monkeys. Come away from the evolutionary teaching that you were taught in school. Realize that you were made by a creator God who loves you. Realize that you're made by a God who, who fashioned you with his own hands, who loves you with all his heart. And come back to worship him. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Friends, there's, no, there's two choices this evening that we have. I know for some of people this has been a shock because you're not often taught this from, uh, from preachers today. But friends, if it's not taught, that doesn't mean it's not true. It just means it's not up at the forefront. People don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable. And toes get bruised and they don't, people don't like that. So we t say smooth things to satisfy. But friends, this evening, there's only two choices that we have. It's only two choices. Either we go with the written Word of God that we have in our hands, or we go with tradition. There's only two choices. In fact, let me take my Bible as we close here this evening, and I direct your attention to the book of Matthew chapter 15, and I want you to notice what Jesus had to say. Matthew chapter 15, and notice with me verse 9. Matthew 15, and notice with me verse 9. Jesus said some very striking things about the traditions of men, friends. Very cutting words. Notice what he says. But in vain... Excuse me, let me read verse 8 first. This people draws near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but yet their heart is far from me. Verse 9. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You see, Jesus had a problem with the religious leaders of his day. Because they were teaching things that weren't according to the Bible. They were teaching traditions of men. And friends, sadly, sadly, modern day Christianity for the most part has fallen into this category because we've forgotten our roots. We've forgotten the Bible, friends. In fact, this is our only choice. The catechism, tradition, or the Bible. And friends, this will become more clear as these lectures go on. You might be here seated here tonight mad. You might say, man, I, I hate that little guy. What's he talking about up there? But friends, I don't care if you're mad or not. You need to keep coming to these lectures because it'll become more clear. You'll see from various sources that this is indeed the case. In fact, we here tonight have the same choice that those people had way back when when Jesus was brought before Caiaphas there in the temple court. We have two choices, friends. Either we accept Rome or we accept Jesus. There's only two choices. Friends, I want you to follow Jesus. I don't want you to follow traditions of men. And I believe as we study the Bible night by night, it'll become clearer that Christ and Him alone is worthy of our worship and the beast and His worship we should not give because He didn't create us, He didn't redeem us. Only Christ did that.